All right. So I'm going to be talking about boost build today. Um, let's start off with a sim simple example here. So here we're creating a library using the lib rule, and we're having, giving it a single source file, uh, no special options or anything. Then uh, on the second line, we create an executable that from a single source file and that also links to the library. So in boost build, when we link to a library, you just list it along with the other sources. Uh, I can run that. Is that big enough? Yes. Okay. So, so the program that we use for running boost build is B2. And then you can run it. It's boost build ends up generating this in a very deep directory. That can be kind of annoying. And we can run it. So uh, in the default configuration, just we've then built this as a shared library. On uh, If we want to build a static library instead, Uh, you can say link equals static, and we've built libmylib.a instead. Yes? Okay. I've actually lots of questions. <laughs> um, one, it, is there a way you can set where that gets put, like the bin, the bin slash GCC? Uh, you can control everything by saying okay. equals, let's say, And then, whoops, it doesn't work. Oh, I see. Yes? All right. So what is the conceptual difference between link and builder? Why one has double da uh, dash before it and <laughs> Yeah. It's, it always puzzled me about uh, who's built. OK, so in general, when you s the link things with no dash, those are uh, properties which are handled spe have lots of special handling in the library. Uh, I don't know if there's necessarily a conceptual difference. We, what we try to do is anything that affects how the targets get built g is as handled as a property. Then uh, we hack in various options. At random, <laughs> with the dash dash option. Uh, so link is appropriate. Yes. So one of the things is that if if you have uh, like builder, that's completely global. It affects everything in your build. The properties like link equals static, those can be applied to specific targets. Like you can build one library as a static library and an executable that links to it. And then you can build another different library as a shared library. And that works just fine. Uh, but the global options like that builder, well, you have to specify whatever it's going to be called when you look it up. But does that have to be specified every time you run V2? Or can uh, you like be like, here's my options and set up and like a so, OK, so the question is, uh, do we have to specify builder every time we run B2? Yeah. Um, I think you do. Okay. There, there is some framework for specifying those things in a configuration file. But I don't know whether it applies to builder. OK. But OK, are you going to show like, how to do that configuration file? Uh, so to, So, so that should allow Builder to work. Yeah, so now everything is built under that directory. Okay. Yes? Um, can we get Boost Build to tell us the nested target directory? I have some tooling around using Boost Build and then capturing the executables. And right now, I have to do some inferring to figure out where the heck they went. 
Well, if, if you want it to build in a specific location, gener you, you can force it to do that. Uh, boost build, the, the problem with asking for where the builder is, is you might have multiple directories. So for instance, if I say, If I say that, uh, apparently you, it can't link. There's no static library for the uh, GCC. Oh, I know what it is. I tried to mix a, uh, 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 static uh, libgcc with the shared uh, library, which doesn't work very well. That's probably what it is. So in this case, we have like six or eight different build directories. So asking where it's going to put it, that's not going to work very well. You could, um, so if you actually need it in a specific, if, if you're only building one library or one version, then you can get away with something like stall. And if you do that, it creates a target called install, which copies uh, test into the directory containing the containing this jam file. Okay. Is there a way, is there a way that you can customize the install location? Is that that location variable like? So the question is: Is there a way to customize the install location? For this simple install rule, there is not. There's a more Sophisticated one, which is the one used by the top-level boost jam file, which you can specify prefix and so on. Okay. Yes. So this is a prerequisite to this. So, so the first argument to install is the name of the target. The second argument is the sources for that target. So in this case, uh, test is the source for install. It it finds that test is an executable, and it. And location tells you where it's going to put it. Technically, you can apply location to any, any target. It's generally only used for installing. Yes? Is that location a placeholder, meaning we should substitute an actual directory there? Or is that literally the text that we have to put in? So the question is, is location a placeholder, or is it literally the text you put in? It is literally the text you put in. So location is, so when we say, uh, when you put like link equals link equals static on the command line, uh, inside jam files, the syntax you would use would be using these. That would be represented as uh, like that. So that's how we represent properties in a jam file. Uh, okay. Nate. So if you were building a specific one of these targets, I could put in the command line location equals and the place I want it. Yes. The qu so the question is, uh, could you put location on the command line? And the answer is yes. That's generally a bad idea because it will force everything to build in, the, in a single directory. But you can do that. Yeah, this is a use case that I would build a single X target and, uh, and put it where I want it. Uh, Paul. Um, if you wanted to install both the test executable and the my lab, do you create another install install for that, or can you list there when it says test? Or how does the syntax so, work? so the question is, if you want to install multiple things, yeah. uh, OK. So you can, you can list as many sources as you want. So you could say test and mylib and install both of them. You can also specify that you only install targets of a specific type. Okay. Or so you could say, and you can also specify that you want to install all dependencies as well. So, so, if you wanted a specific type, do you just put lib there? So, and it installs so, all the targets? So, the question is if you want a specific type, you would you put lib? I believe it's 
something along the lines of target install target type uh, lib. Oh. I don't know. I, I'm not sure that that's the exact name given to the uh, feature. It's something along those lines. And there's also install dependencies, which causes it to recursively look through the dependency tree and find everything. So generally, you'll use install all dependencies that are libraries, for instance. Oh, okay. Yes. Okay, just to my understanding, so reading this slide, first install is the type of the rule. The second install is the name of the target. Then you have a list of, you call them arguments to the rule, right? Yeah, the sources. Right. And then you have a list of properties for this target. Yes. I think it's just install type. What? Is it just install type instead of install target type? Install type? It might be. Uh, Let's see. That's Never mind. That's not important. But the name isn't that important. All right. So, so are we good on that? Uh, yes. So, how do, what was, will be the sequence of install and builds? Like you have this in Emacs, you have two targets. If they are out of date, are they going to be both built first and then installation happens, or are they kind of installed sim interleavingly? And well, okay, so the question was, what is the order that these things happen in? So, uh, I don't. I think it's possible that. Okay, so I think each target is copied independently, and that means that there is no dependency from a single. OK, so you might end up installing some and then building more and then installing and building. There's nothing to force the order. Uh, if you wanted to force that, you'd have to say something. If you added a, an explicit dependency, like, let's see, then that would force everything in that target to be built after my lib, I believe. Yes? What? OK, so you won't install mylib until after mylib is built. But you might install test before mylib is built. Ah, yes? If I'm installing into a system location, is there any way to specify sudo or something like that? Uh, no, there isn't. So I have to run the whole process. OK, so the question was, is there a way to specify sudo, or do you have to run the whole thing? There is no support for specifying sudo, so you have to put it around the whole thing. Yeah. Yes? This is not like an install like that type of install. Sorry? It's not that type of an install to This is like package, package up results and stick them somewhere. Pretty much. And the most useful part of it is you can say, all the dependencies that were required along the way, like the libraries and whatever else you needed, package those up and stick them in this directory. So you know you just have one this nice little directory that you know might be what will be used later for your, your actual installation. So if I'm pa packaging something for a distribution, I'm not going to use this to install to, to kind of create the actual install to like you know what I will do on USM. No, you would use it to make that tree to to get the tree together for the packaging. It seems like the equivalent of setting your prefix or whatever in the configure step. Yeah. Right. So for, for, for example, for Debian, you need to. So when you're running this, all the prefixes where it where it's done, right? Yeah. So, so, so install is kind of badly named. A better name would probably be like copy files. <laughs> because that's. That's what install does. Yeah. That's yes. But. So yeah. Whatever, yeah. Whatever yeah. Well, and there is a. A fancier version of install that takes, that does more, but okay. uh, I wasn't planning on it. I can talk about that at some later. Uh, but are we good on this? All right. Yes. Can you make something depend on an install. Yes. Okay. And and install is just 
like any other target. I don't know if this is actually going to compile to build, so let's delete some of these. Let's bring this back to that. And then I can say, uh, I don't know whether this is going to work. Let's see. It won't, probably, but let's try it. That's what I was afraid of. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it, so for t test targets, you generally don't need to specify the name, so it's put last. But when you do, it's annoying. Nope, I got. Not again. All right, uh, let's move on. So if, if I put the uh, name of the target in the right place, you could use the install target as a source for more things if you really wanted to and add dependencies on it. Um. All right. So the basic model that we use for the targets is that when you say link equals static on the command line, that passes that property to the top level targets. So in this case, test. Then the system sees that test depends on mylib. So then it takes that link equals static and passes it on to mylib. And then, so it ends up, yes, um, David. So is isn't everything a top-level target? Or, or is there something else? Right. So all the targets that you define at the top level are built by default. Uh, you can explicitly exclude some targets from that. So if you said, say, explicit mylib, then mylib would no longer be considered in all. Paul? Do you generally make the tests like, excluded from all so that they so the, so the question is, do you generally make tests excluded from all? That's, it's not done by default. And in Boost, we generally put all the tests in a separate jam file. Okay. So it's not even an issue. Okay. And uh, uh, th th this also works across jam files. So if you're referring to a target in another jam file, it will pass the arguments on to that target. And those would not be in your default set for the current jam file. So actually, if I wanted to be complete, there would also be an edge from the uh, top level command line to mylib as well, which gets merged because it's the same. So one of the uh, consequences of this design is that you cannot write t tests like this. So what this is doing is trying to determine if we're building for Windows and add a different source if we're building on, say, Linux. Uh, code like that won't work because you have no idea what the target OS is until you're actually building the target. It is not known when you're processing the jam file, which is kind of annoying. Uh, if you want to do it, write code like that. Yes? So this is code that does not work? Yes. Okay. Right. Yes. That's why it's crossed out. <laughs> okay. And this is really slow. Yes, this code does not work. So if you want to write something like that, the correct way is to use target alternatives. So target alternatives are essentially like overloading your target. So you can tell that this build is written by people who are used to writing C++. Um, so in this case, the alias rule says this target is essentially the same as all the other, as your sources, but maybe some extra stuff. So in this case, your requirements are for Windows for the first one. And you, in the second one, there is no requirements. So boost build will choose what it considers to be 
the best match when it tries to build that target. So if you're building on Windows, then it sees the first one matches, the second one also matches because it has no requirements, and the first one is a better match because it's more specific. Yes? Do you think it would be I don't know, easier if we just attach this condition to the target? So you basically say windows.cpp and then let's say like a kind of an attribute or something in brackets. We, uh, target or is equally called windows. So the question is, would it be uh, uh, simpler to put it as attached to the targets? It's like a condition that is attached to, to the target. So the question is, would it be simpler as a conditional attached to the targets? And so one thing that we could do would be would be like th th this as a as a property, we'll add that uh, windows.cpp as a source only if target OS as Windows is also present. So if we put that, we would have to put that uh, here in the requirements or whatever. So there are several ways to solve the problem. The target alternatives are Uh, are generally preferred when they work. So is that clear to everyone? So yes. When they work. Yeah. Y yes. So so this is this can only handle simple cases. Like if you can if you can specify. This target happens under th these conditions. This target happens under these conditions. If you can express that easily as combinations of properties, it works great. That's, it, that, that's a definition of, of if they work. Yeah. So, yes, that, Paul. Does that, oh, sorry. Does, that create a, does that actually create a target, or does that create a, a set of sources that you can then put in a target? So the question is, does that create a target, or does that create a set of sources that you can put in a target? Yeah. There is really no difference. Because as far as boost build is concerned, these targets that you're creating, they, they're called meta targets. They're actually a thing that takes a property set as an argument and it returns a list of the file targets that it represents. It's basically like a target interface in uh, I'm not sure exactly what that is. But so, so when you say sources, that simply returns windows.cpp when you call it, and then it passes windows.cpp to whatever target is, depends on it. And it acts exactly as if you had just put windows.cpp as an argument to that dependent target. Because it declares the alias. But if it was like lib, you would actually have an output of like lib sources.a, and it builds a static library. Whereas this would now put a, this would now put like a lib. Or so this does not create, this. Do, an alias by itself does not create anything. Yeah. It, simply, it simply bundles other targets together. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, David, did you have something? Um, just kind of like one follow on. So, target OS dash windows in this case, when we're using alias, I think I understand what that means. What would happen if you put target dash OS windows on a, uh, like a lib thing? That it, it, it would have exactly. So you build the lib if it was on Windows? It, so if you have multiple alternatives, then it chooses the best one regardless of the target type. So if you put, had two libs and one of them had target OS dot window, windows, then it, they would build the, on Windows it would build the library that has the target OS. However, this can get kind of complicated. So generally when you're using target alternatives, I find that it's almost always best to use it use aliases to control it. The extra level in fin direction makes things a lot easier. And then yes. the aliases with the same name are conditional. Aliases. So any alias with the same name is conditional. Right. So all targets with the same name are are 
are merged together into a single main target. So they're essentially overloaded, like I said. Nate? If you remove the conditional on the first, um, would this be ill-formed, or would it merge them? Or if, you if you remove the, the target OS on the first one, it would complain that there's no best match. Okay. That wouldn't pick the first one. Either. Yes. Does, does Boost Build support preparation of distributions with packaging your project for distribution? So does Boost Build support packaging your project for distribution? Uh, no, it does not. Because that, that, that would be get tricky because if you did, you would need to actually package all of them. You cannot use this term, term the term OS anymore. You want to ignore. Uh, I'm sorry, I don't follow. If you if if it did support, then this part will get tricky because you you need to actually package both of them. You cannot ignore one of them. Doesn't become an alternative to be a package. Uh, yeah, never mind. Just Wait. So. Talking about packaging the source files. Yeah. Uh, I see. Uh, no, there's there's definitely no support for that. Uh, if, it it might be possible to do something along those lines because all of these things are data structures that have with a public API. But so you could probably access it and do something, but it wouldn't be fun, and there's no built-in support for that. All right. So I want to talk now about features and properties. So features are generally used to control uh, everything in the build process. So debug and release are actually uh, associated with a feature known as variant. So if you just say debug on the command line, that's, or, or you say variant equals debug, they're exactly the same thing. Uh, it's so common that we decided that uh, to shorten it, create a short alias for it. Uh, uh, link equals static. It also controls the tool set. So that's how we build with like 15 different compilers in the, in the same uh, BGM invocation. Uh, then there are others like more like CXX flags, include, and define. Paul. So, how would you say specifically what version of compiler is there? Uh, like so, you could say GCC dash uh, 4.0 or 5.1. Oh, okay. And then if you were using like a specially named compiler that was a fork of claim, like could you put that there like my claim as your compiler? So the question is, uh, if you're using a specially named version of Clang, could you put that there? So in general, if you're using a uh, non-default compiler, you have to put entries in a configuration file that tell you the name of the compiler, the exact path to the compiler, and so on. And that's what you would do with your cross-compiling Yes. So the question is, is that what you would do is when you're cross-compiling as well? The answer is yes. Uh, you had something? I was going to comment about the user config.jam. Right. Right, so user config.jam, let me show you mine. It's very simple. But you can put all the, could you put all those properties or all those features in the user config.jam? Uh, the question was, could you put all those features in your user config.jam? The answer is that you can. It might not be a good idea because that's completely global to everything. Uh, okay. Uh, uh, where is? There we go. So the question is, when you invoke B2, can you specify what user config.jam you want to use? And the answer is, you say dash dash user config equals blah. Okay. So here's mine. That's it. That's it. <laughs> So you say, using GCC, and the next argument is the version, which I'm leaving empty t to tell it to figure it out for itself. And I'm saying it's called G++. Actually, I could leave out the G++ because that would be the default, too. So I could just say using GCC. But if you want another compiler, you would change that G++ there to whatever you want. Yes? And then the set the variables, like if you want to say you want the GCC to use C++14, you would do 
you write C at six flags equals C plus plus. Yes. So the question was, if you want to uh, say use like C plus plus fourteen, do you use CXX flags? Yes, you use CXX flags for that. Is it used like a using syntax? Is that how you set it? Or how oh, so, so the question is, how do you set that? And the, to do that, you'll want to s set the uh, properties. There are several ways to. You can set properties on an individual target at the level of a project or on the command line, basically. Well, I figured I want to set it. In the user. So if you want to set it in the user config.jam ev for everything globally, then you would say. Uh, You would say requirements in the project declaration, and then you can just list whatever you want there. And that will be inherited by everything. Uh, okay. Okay. And you can also put the CXX flags after the G++ that you have there, right? Uh, the question is, can you put the CXX flags after the G++? Uh, yes. yes, I think you can. There's an extra. Slot. Yes, there's an extra argument on the using GCC that allows you to specify flags that will be used for that specific compiler. Oh, okay. However, uh, the rules for those are slightly different and weird. Well, actually, the rules for using GCC are sane. The rules for the CXX flags property are not. Okay. Actually, never mind. It's not the CXX flags that's weird. It's C flags, because C flags applies to C++. Which is a mistake, but one that's difficult to fix because without breaking things. So, if you, so this here using the project that applies it everywhere. If we could also put it so to, as a control W. We could also say that, and that will work, and it will only apply to that. Uh, to uses of that tool set. Okay. So if we wanted to build, use Clang, it would not use that. And, and, but like if I want to use Visual Studio, can you still do six and flags? As, well, I guess I'm right at So if you wanted. Clang, Clang that would work as well. Yes. Clang. Yeah. If you, uh, of course, I can't use Visual Studio from here. Yeah, well, I mean, when you see six flags for that, I mean, when you see C++ for Visual Studio. Yeah. Yeah. I'm yes. curious about your using Python in there. Um, so the reason I put using Python there was because I was testing some issues with uh, Python support. Uh -huh. uh, so what used to happen was that uh, if you said using Python and Python was not available, then things would crash. So I fixed that. And now, if you, if you don't say using Python, it will attempt to build Python anyway. And I finally fixed that in the develop, but it, hasn't made it, it didn't make it into the la latest release. So now, uh, if you just build Boost, it will try to build Python regardless of whether it's available or not. Yes. So basically, the auto detection of Python was broken in some ways. So I think I've finally gotten it right. So that was just for testing that. I, I don't actually need it myself. I just wonder what the semantics of it were. But, but it's, it's for detecting the Pythons there so that it can build boost Python. Yes, specific. It's, well, the Pyth using Python in the user config, it, it can, it's not specific to boost Python. It just detects uh, where the Python Correct. program lives, where the libraries live, and so on and so forth. It could, in principle, be used for anything that needed to use py Python. Right. Like if I have my own code that, that I wanted to build Python bindings in C++ for. Right. If you had your own Python bindings, you could use that. If you wanted to have a special up build step that calls Python to do something, All run some kind of scripts, mm -hmm. yes. You could use like that. Wanted, yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, all right. So features are actually quite complicated. 
the, uh, they have a number of attributes. So propagated features are features that if you use them for a target, they will be used for all dependent targets as well. So like link, the static linking, that's passed on to dependent targets. Uh, the tool set, all of those. Uh, free features are features whose values are not constrained. So most features have to be from a fixed set of known values. So if you say, like, uh, say, variant. variant. So if you said variant, you have three possible choices, uh, debug, release, and profile. Uh, it's possible to define your own, but by default, uh, you, you must, if you specify anything else, it will be an immediate error. Because, hey, I have no idea what you're talking about. Uh, free features have no such constraints, so like, which is needed for things like CXX flags. You can pass whatever you want there. Uh, path features are features that refer to a specific uh, file system locations. So they're used for things like include. It, it guarantees that the paths are adjusted correctly and bound relative to the right locations. Uh, so include and location are both path features. Uh, path is usually used for directories. Uh, if you want to have a uh, feature that refers to a specific file, then you'll want to mark that is generally marked as a dependency feature instead. A dependency feature uh, can all, the difference is that a dependency feature can refer to a, a target in your jam file in addition to a file, a, a real file that already exists or that you're going to create or something. So uh, the canonical example of dependency feature is like, is the, dependent, the feature called dependency, which says this target depends on this other target. Uh, there are other, like, source is also a dependency feature. So you can add, use a feature to add additional uh, sources to your library. Uh, composite features are features whose, that are composed of other, a set of properties. So variant uh, uh, is a composite feature. So th the debug variant is actually equivalent to saying uh, optimization off, uh, debug symbols on, inlining off, a few other things, possibly. The release is just the opposite and turns on and debug. Uh, incidental features are features that the system really doesn't care about. So in general, they're features that don't affect the build results. So if you say, like, warnings on, well, you'll get the same results regardless of whether you have warnings on or not. So when boost build if you try to build the target two different ways, Boost will say, well, you want warnings on here, you want warnings off here, but you'll get the same result either way. I don't care which one you use, just pick one. So it will try to respect what you say, but if it runs into trouble, it'll just ignore you. <laughs> so, so, like I said, warnings, template depth, C++ template depth is another one like that. Because as long as it builds, you don't care how, how, de how deep you allow your template instantiations to go, as long as it builds successfully. Uh, yes? So does it mean if you change a non-incidental feature, then it will actually pick it up and update everything you have So the question is, if you change a non-incidental feature, will it re force a rebuild? Uh, the answer is no, it does not. I've thought about trying to figure out how to do that, but... Uh, no, at the moment it doesn't. It would be a nice thing to tr do, but uh, it's not there. Um, yes. Maybe the answer to that certain of the features, uh, you know, cause a change in the target uh, directory, um, the location that is, you know, uh, inferred. And so, um, if you change certain of those features, such as debug or release, your target gets put in a different directory. And so, you know. Yes. That's correct. So the comment was that when you change certain features, it changes the directory that you're building into, and that will cause you to rebuild. And that is correct. Uh, any, if, if the features are 
That doesn't work if you're using free features like CXX flags because those are not encoded into the build path. It will work for things like the debugger release and the tool set. So I guess that partially solves the problem, but not completely. Yeah. Uh, there are a few more. These are the important ones, I think. Um, but what you yes. can do, um, you can just define an additional tool set with, let's say, different CXX flags, and that will force a rebuild if you just change the tool set instead of the CXX flags. So the comment was, you can just build a uh, tool set that has different CXX flags and that will force a, it to build to a different place and so it will force a rebuild. Uh, yes, you can do that. Uh, in general, what I recommend is building a new composite feature that, compo that uses those CXX flags. So variant is common. You can build your own things that exa act exactly like variant. Uh, any more questions? No. Whoop. OK, so the properties can be specified in a number of places. I already, so we've already seen on the command line. On the target, you actually have three slots for uh, properties. The first slot is the requirements, which if you specify flags in, as requirements, then they must be used to build the target. And the requirements will also be used to select the target alternative if you have multiple targets. Uh, the default build is flags that will be used if, if you don't specify them to be something else. Uh, and the usage requirements are properties that must be used for any targets that depend on you. So this is commonly used in when building a library you can set macros and includes for anything that depends on that library. Um, you can specify uh, all three of these uh, requirements, default build and usage requirements on a project. Uh, it's, it's that, yes, David. Um, so with the usage requirements, that would be like, for example, if I have a library, anybody who uses my library, they better have this defined set. Yes, that's exactly what you, we use it for. So the comment was, uh, the question was, if uh, the usage requirements would be if, we, if I have my library, anybody that uses it had better have this defined set? Yes. And does that eventually get put into like a package config somewhere so that people know? So the question is, does that eventually get put into a package config somewhere? We do not have any ability to create package config files. Oh, okay. if, if we did, then it would be. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Is there any way to connect to boost projects? Uh, so is the, the question is? I want to have a library which is a separate for, let's say I have a boost, and then I have my own application, and I want to use libraries from boost. So the question is, uh, is there, if you have your own application, is there any way to use, uh, refer to another project, essentially? Yeah. OK. Get those usage requirements OK. So if. If you refer to any target anywhere, you always get the usage requirements from that. It doesn't matter where it is, whether it's in the same project, another project. Uh, the only thing is you have to figure out how to refer to that uh, other, other project correctly. Uh, the easiest way is just to spec if you specify the path to it, then it'll, it will just find it. Uh, you can also create a symbolic ID, ID for a project. So it will load all the dependency information. Yes. Yes, so in external projects, you can say something like uh, uh, use project boost at this location, and then you can say, uh, I want uh, boost unit test framework. And I depend on that library, and you'll pick up the usage requirements from that. And uh, when you build it, it will build the boost library as well. Uh, let's see. So there are also a couple of other ways to specify uh, properties. 
there's a, this rule called toolset.requirements, which sets a property globally. I strongly advise that you do not use this unless you really know what you're doing. <laughs> because, uh, then finally, if this property is, has, if a, if a feature is not specified in any other way, you'll get the default value. So uh, if, you, if you're just building something, then it will, the default value of the variant is debug. So it will choose that. Is this the exact order of precedence? Uh, like? No, it is not. So, like I said, the, requ the requirements take priority over everything else. The requirements on the target take priority over everything else. Uh, then the build request for that target, which is for the top level targets, the build request is what you specify on the command line. For targets that are needed as, as a dependency, the build request is the propagated properties of the target that you're currently building. Uh, so does that mean the uh, user requirements are propagated also backwards? So usage requirements are propagated up the stack. Uh, I should say that usage requirements must be free properties. Free features. You can't you can't specify debug as a as a usage requirement. The reason is uh, managing everything to make sure everything is consistent is a total nightmare if we allowed it to be general. Free features append when you try to combine them. So adding extra flags is fairly easy and safe. Trying to override things that you've already set and possibly made decisions based on is it's too late for that. So normal requirements propagate down the stack to dependencies. Usage requirements propagate up to. Any more questions? So this is just uh, using the requirements at the project level. So as you can see, we're just setting a define so we can set the uh, DLL import correctly when you, when you uh, use this library. I, uh, yes? Okay, so the usage requirements um, propagates upward to set link shared and define the symbol. Right. And you have it in requirements as well. Right. So the requirements are used to build everything in this project. So if you're building this is this is com this this pattern is common in library jam files. So you use this flag when you're building the the, tar the projects itself, and you also want to use it when you're building anything that depends on it. David. Never mind. Okay. So you, you'll you'll see this in almost every library jam file in Boost, although the default build I just added, but this requirements and usage requirements is everywhere. Yes. Okay. Um, so what you would add more stuff to say. Um, to get your DLL export stuff. It would be DLL export for the usage requirements, or for the requirements and DLL import for the usage requirements if you have to define for that too. Uh, so the question is... Like if you're building on Windows and you need right. to... Right. So, so normally the way that we handle uh, usage DLL import versus DLL export is you have one symbol that controls whether you're building as a static library or a shared library. And then there's a second macro which is defined, which says, this is the source for this library. So you would say, like, my lib source as a second macro that's only in the requirements. That's the common pattern that we use, I believe. 30 minutes. OK, I'll try to speed up here. Um, right, so we've already talked a little bit about conditional properties. The ones, the, the, the stuff on the uh, left side of the colon is the condition. The right side is the things you're going to apply. So here we add uh, disable warning 4512. What is that? Conditional expression? No, that's compile. Assignment operator could not be generated, I think. <laughs> Anyone know? <laughs> One of those useless warnings. Uh, so we add that flag only for uh, Visual Studio. Uh, that's, that covers a lot of cases, but uh, if you need something more complex, you can specify an arbitrary 
arbitrary code that pr processes the, the properties and adds uh, whatever you want. So, so this conditional thing, you give it an at sign and then a rule name. And that will pass the current properties and you return the new properties you want to add. Yes? The first, the first thing you have up there, is that all a single line? Uh, that, is not that is not runnable code. Uh, which, the, which part? The first two th things, they would be, uh, you'd put those in your requirements. So that is runnable code? Uh, it, 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 it won't compile as written because it's, it needs to be in, a, in the correct context. So, would you mind just repeating the, the semantics of that first line? Bit? Okay, so, so, uh, tool set is MSVC, okay. if the tool set is MSVC, then we apply uh, uh, slash WD4512 on the command line. Uh, that, those, both of those would be applied. And, and the, the so, that would go in this section generally. You would, take those two lines and put them in here. If you just put them at the top level, they have to be put in the right context. I was just... As a single line? But is that intended to be a single line? Okay. Uh, Boost build doesn't... The, the syntax doesn't care about new lines okay. Okay. at all. So you... It's, it's just white space. And the at conditional thing, what, what does that mean? So... So by convention, if you want... If you have a feature that ref, that's supposed to refer to a function, you use that at symbol. So it's a, it's a convention for creating sort of function pointers. Like in, in Jam, everything is a, is a list of strings, but we often need some way to pass something like a function pointer around, so we pass the name of it with this at sign and do some extra processing to in, internally to make sure that it actually works correctly. So if the tool set is MSVC, does it somehow call that extra props thing then? Yeah, is so that what the angle bracket conditional add extra props means? Uh, so, so when you build the target, it takes a look at all these conditional properties and adds the ones that, it, that, it, that are needed in, the correct, in that context of build, in that build context. Because there seems to be a difference. So, so the first line is like, it's sort of understood that the tool set is MSVC, then you add these C CXX flags. And then there's this conditional thing, and I, I'm not sure how that okay. comes in. Okay, so the conditional thing is, it, it calls this function extra props, which is defined here, with the current properties, and it figures out what extra things you need to add based on those properties, which in this case is just link static. So this whole thing here, conditional extra props, is equivalent to just writing link static at the top level. Is that, is that connected then to the first thing? So if no, there, there's no relation between those there's two. There's no relationship. There's no relationship. They're 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 just they're just two separate examples. Okay. 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 Thank you. Right. So so for there are a few, some special rules for. Uh, configuration purposes. This configure.check target builds rule takes three arguments. It takes a target, which you're going to test whether it build, successfully builds or not. You take a list of properties, which will be applied if the target does build. And you take a list of properties that will be applied if the target does not build. Uh, this check library is similar to that, except instead of taking a general target, it takes an, ex an external library and determines whether that library exists or not. So you can do something different depending on whether you can find, say, zlib. Uh, Predef.check, it basically does the same thing. It gives a list of properties that you apply if it th works, a list of properties to apply if it doesn't work, and it's based on macros defined by Boost Predef. Uh, the last two, Predef.requires and Config.requires, uh, are simplified to simply disable the target from building if the requirements are not met. Uh, I have an example of this is from the IO streams jam file. So here 
we're checking whether Zlib is around. If it is, then we add, add it as a library and we add the two source files that depend on Zlib. Does that make sense? So this Zlib requirements is a variable that would end up being used in the requirements of the IO streams library. No, I mean, this AC check library, and then you have this, what looks like an absolute path, but then it has this double. OK, so this slash Zlib slash slash Zlib is the uh, boost build syntax for referring to a target. So the thing before the double slash is either a path to a, another jam file or it is a symbolic name that's been assigned somewhere. In this case, uh, the Zlib project is created by uh, the configuring the module that helps, allow, helps you configure Zlib. So earlier on in the iStream jam file, there's a line that says using Zlib, which, which uh, defines this target. Anything else? Yes, David. I'm just curious as to, so this looks like a different notation than I'm used to, the equals and then like the square brackets. Right, so the, the, those square brackets are essentially a function, the function call syntax used by Jam. So originally, for, uh, Jam had, had, had pure procedures. Functions never returned a result. So this was pre-boost Jam, uh, perforce Jam. Then when they decided to add the ability to return, they decided, well, it's returning a list, so let's put it in square brackets. <laughs> so, so yeah, so that's basically the function call syntax. Arguments are separated by a colon, and uh, the equals is assignment. All right, so uh, for referring to external libraries, the simplest way is just to say lib kernel 32. If you don't specify any sources for a library, it will assume that you mean it's just something out there in the system. So th if you then refer to kernel 32 as a target, it will essentially just say dash L kernel 32 on the linker command line. Uh, if you want something more complicated, uh, uh, things like Zlib have a, has a sp dedicated module for uh, detecting where Zlib, where to find Zlib, and so on. Uh, I was planning to show some of that, but I think I'm running short on time. So basically this, uh, never mind. All right. So. Uh, when you have a project with boost build, uh, at the top level you have a file called jam root. Then in all the various subdirectories, it sh you have a jam file. Uh, the reason for this is that uh, every project inherits various things from its parent projects, and by ha the jam root essentially stops that and says this is the top, and don't go in don't recurse any farther into parents. S so we can always get this way. We always get consistent results. Um, you'll see a lot of things like jamfile.v2 in the boost directories. That's mostly for historical reasons because uh, for, from the time when we supported boost build version 1, which is completely obsolete now, and boost build version 2 at the same time when we were uh, in the process of migrating. Uh, if you want to add a .jam extension because you, don't like ex because you run on Windows and don't like extensionless files, you can add that. Uh, jamfile.jam works fine too. Uh, all right, so for running tests, there are, uh, the testing module provides a number of useful tools. So this run rule will, it creates a test which will pass if and only if the source is build into an build link and then executes with uh, non-zero exit status. Uh, compile is similar, but it only runs the compiler. It does not attempt to link. 
and it passes if it compiles successfully. This is most common in metaprogramming libraries. Compile fail is the opposite. It will pass, it, the test will pass if and only if uh, attempting to compile fails. Paul. Um, does that include runtime? So if it compiles and when it runs, the test fails as well? Is that included in the compile fail? So compile fail does not attempt to run it at all. It will only compile it. If, if, if it. Okay. So, right, compile fail runs the compiler and inverts the status effectively. Oh, okay. Is there like a run fail? Yes, there is. There is. That takes into account compile failure? No, it does not. So, uh, it's technically difficult to propagate the status in that way. It's the underlying jam build engine can handle it. Unfortunately, actually setting up the data structures is a bit difficult and doesn't fit well with the abstractions used by boost build. Okay. Right, you're going to? Yeah. Um, can you test whether it fails for the right reason? Because yeah. I, I think the use case for compile fail is you want to check whether your static assert is successful. But when you put the wrong include directory, it also fails. Okay. So the question is, can you check if it fails for the right reason? And no, it does not. It only checks whether it compiles or not. Uh, the main reason is that it's technically extremely difficult to check what the, what the actual error is in a portable way. It, it depends heavily on uh, locale and, so, and specific compiler and so on. And uh, we didn't want to deal with that. I, actually, we probably didn't even think of it when this was originally created. Uh, and there's also uh, 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 run fail and link and link fail for completeness, although they're very rarely used. Uh, link fail is almost, I've only seen it used a handful of times, basically for testing that uh, ODR violations are detected. That's about the only use I've ever seen for it. Yes? Um, the use of the boost symbolic variable there, are we assuming that this uh, particular jam file is outside of the boost tree, or is this even useful within the boost tree? So the question is, are, for the, this boost slash unit test framework, are we assuming that this is outside the boost tree, or is this useful in the boost tree? So in the boost tree, this is how you write it. Okay. Because the slash boost is guaranteed to be available as the so that slash boost is the top level boost super project, which has aliases for all the libraries to give you a simple name to refer to it as. If you're outside of boost, you still want to write it this way, except you'll also have to add something to load, to load the boost jam files. So you'd have to say use project boost plus the path to boost somewhere. Use project boost and not using boost? Right. So. To, OK, I was going to get to that, actually, in a moment. Right. So if you want to refer to something else, there are a whole bunch of different rules. Uh, so the first, import, allows you to call functions from that module. So after I say import regex, I could say uh, regex.match. Using is use. Uh, allows you to configure some kind of tool that might call external programs. It takes extra arguments to help you to tell it where, where to find them. So if I say using Boostbook, I could add the paths to the Boostbook XSL scripts, the Docbook XSL scripts, and so on. Uh, and, and after you say, using generally goes in like your user config or project config.jam files. Uh, if you say use project, that refers to a, another jam file. So in this case, uh, I'm, uh, I have my boost checkout in uh, boost git, and I've built another directory with my own project in parallel to that. So that tells me how to find that. And then finally, build project will say, if I'm building this uh, project, this jam file, then I'll also build another sub-project at the same time, automatically. Does, does that mean 
that that one would have to have a gem root then in that subdirectory? Uh, no. So the question is, does does that build project mean you have to have a jam root in the subdirectory? Uh, it could have a jam root. It could also have. It's generally used for jam file. So what's the difference then between having uh, just a normally structured set of directories where there's jam root at the top and jam files everywhere else? So the question Does is that automatically get built. Or? So the question is, what's the difference between having jam root at the top and uh, jam file everywhere else? That's kind of a different thing. So. In your, in each jam file is independent. It will only build the targets that are defined in that jam file by default. So if you want to build targets in a sub, in a, at, in the subdirectory, then you, you need to use build project. It doesn't auto, so when you say, when you build at the top level, it does not automatically build everything in the tree. If you want to build everything in the tree, you have to use this build project thing to specify where the rest of the tree is. And uh, a brief talk about the language. It's a f so the language semantics are a fairly straightforward procedural language. Uh, you can create local variables. Uh, you can create your loops. Uh, you refer to the variables using this dollars with parentheses syntax. Uh, there's also a while loop and a switch statement that does string matching of some sort. Um, functions are defined with the keyword rule. Uh, the arguments list goes in parentheses. Uh, if you put the star, it means you can have any number of. So e every variable in Jam is a list of strings. In the variable, in the ar parameter list, if you have the star, it means it accepts any number of arguments. If you have a plus, it takes one or more. And if you just have nothing, it means it takes. Uh, a single string, a list containing a single element. Uh, so in this case, we're taking the uh, x dash y. If we call it with ABC and one two three, that it will. When we expand it, it will take the cross product. So it will be a one, uh, a two, a three, b one, b two, b three, c one, c two, c three. Yes, everything is a list of strings. So when we expand multiple variables in a single thing, yeah. So what will this return? So that returns a list containing nine strings from this argument because it combines them pairwise. Um. So the main things to watch out for when you're using Jam. So first of all, local variables have dynamic scope. I don't think I need to explain to anyone here why dynamic scope is evil, right? <laughs> then uh, everything is a list of strings. So Jam has its own uh, class system. So you can, you can define a class and create objects using new. But everything is really a list of strings, so, that cr so that's so we had to put some evil hacks in to make it look like it's a, an object. Uh, the biggest annoyance that hits everyone is the, the dumb lexer. So the lexer, all it does is it breaks tokens at white space, except inside double quotes. That's it. It has no notion of what's an operator or so on and so forth. So, so therefore, this, um, there's a white space required for the closing semicolon. Yes. You must put white space before your closing semicolon. So the question is, can the lexer be updated to parse it in a better way? I have wanted to do that for a very long time. The problem is I'm afraid of breaking the world. <laughs> because if we did it, remember, the colon is used in Windows paths. <laughs> so now you have to quote all your Windows absolute paths. Now. I've considered issuing a warning about such things for a transition period. Yeah. But yeah. So I suspect that most of 
the code inside Boost would compile would still work. What I'm afraid of is that we do have people outside of Boost that we have no control over. So I have to at least add some kind of deprecation period. And then finally, it has this uh, wacky function call syntax. Which, it, it works pretty, it, it looks pretty nice for declaring targets, but for c calling functions in general context, it's kind of odd. Yeah. So is declaring a, a target actually calling a function? Yes, declaring a target essentially calls a function. So, so in a lot of, in some of the more compli complex gem files, you'll see people defining their own rules that define uh, targets in some special way. And when they finally actually define it, it looks kind of basically the same. Um, all right. So when you run into problems, there are a couple of flags that, can, that are useful for that. Uh, so at least half the time when I see problems on the list, uh, debug configuration tells, gives the answer right away. It basically, debug configuration basically causes Boost Build to print out the details of all the tools that it's using. So it'll tell you uh, GCC version, where, exactly where it found it, where it loaded its configuration files from, and so on and so forth. Uh, debug building shows what properties are used to build each target. It generates, it's generally only useful if you're in small cases because it generates an enormous amount of output. So if you, so, uh, it basic, so basically, if, if a target is being built wrong, you can use debug building to figure out why. Uh, and then this dash n and dash d2, normally boost build just prints out, uh, I've edited this a lot. But if you see here, it normally only prints out the name of the rule and the target that it's building, uh, except when it fails, in which case it prints out the complete command here. Uh, dash D2 causes it to print out the command always, and dash N causes it to print out what it would build, but not actually do it. And then the last thing I have here is uh, the thing I've been working on recently, which is a source level debugger for Jam. So how, how much time do I have left? We have like uh, seven minutes. All right, I'll be fast. I'll try to do this quickly. So uh, What am I looking for? So let's get this back into a buildable state. What happened? State. So then I get this GDB-like interface. I can say, uh, Whoops, what happened? It, what? Uh, it does not support sh shortcuts. Right now it's just hard coded to a fixed name. I'm, I, the inter this, this is still a work in progress. Oh, okay. So I can say help, gives a list of commands. Uh, let's try something that I know will, that I'm pretty sure works. So I can say break gcc.init, and then if I run it, I'm, I'm now in the, this is just inside my user config.jam where it says g using gcc. 
So you can see the G++ argument being passed there. And then, so if I say backtrace, it doesn't attempt to split it into screens like GDB. Like I said, work in progress. So here we have the call to toolset.using and then a bunch of internal stuff. Um, then I can go next and step through. Is there a You mean? Yeah. All right. Okay. Uh, so. Uh, okay. So at some point in the past, I had a version of this that you could actually hook into Emacs GDB mode and step through in the source. However, uh, at, when I made that, I broke this uh, GDB inter command line interface. So I fixed the command line interface and broke the MI interface, and I'm still working on getting both of them working at once. So anyone like this? All right. Uh, any questions? Yes. I noticed I, I don't have a B2 in my path um, on Ubuntu, but I do have a BJAM. Are they the same thing? So the question is, uh, are B2 and BJAM the same thing? Yes, they are. Uh, B2 is the new name that was given to it about three or four years ago. It used to be called BJAM. Okay. It's in us or Ben rather than any kind of boost director. I don't know why. Right. That means, it's, that, that means you have the one from the system, probably. Okay. Uh, for this debugger to work, I had to build it myself. It's, uh, it's in the, a special branch because it's not nearly ready to go back into mainline. So if you check out the debug branch, you can try that out if you run into anything. Um, David. Have you used this debugging tool to solve any problems yet? Have I used this debugging tool to solve any problems? Uh, a couple times, yes, I have. It, it, so the original jam has a, like D all the way up to 13, which prints out lots of information about what it's doing. But that's, I've never used that because it just dumps way too much to be in any way useful. So th this actually works pretty well. It has, uh, looking at the stack doesn't work very well. Uh, it runs into trouble with dynamic scope. But uh, it's at least good enough to, if I set breakpoints, I can step through and see what's going on. Uh, anything else? Okay, so Paul, I had, the, you were asking me about how to uh, uh, write a config header. Uh, yeah, I, I hacked something together quickly, but we're like out of time now. Do you have any? Uh, like a minute. Like a minute. OK, so I can just open the file. <laughs> and that's about it. So it takes about that much code. Uh, all this stuff up here is generic code that could be reused. It, and it ultimately comes down to uh, this thing here. You're defining a, a target. Then uh, you set the target, this macro, to 0 or 1, depending on whether the target compiles. OK. But the, the compile, when you say the compile, you, you want it to exclude it from all because you don't want to try to compile that. Oh, you mean like, yes, that would. That would make sense. Okay. Uh, explicit. There we go. Okay. That, yeah. Okay. So I, I don't guarantee that this, this works completely. Actually, it doesn't, because 
the, I get the include guard wrong. But the, yeah, sure. Yeah, I, I, can, I can email you this. Uh, yeah. All right, so I think we're out of time now. So thank you.